As Prairie Public travels around North America gathering materials for our documentaries, we often come across special places that we like to share with you. One such place was in Lowell, Massachusetts, where the Industrial Revolution comes alive. Lowell is one of the most important cities in the American Industrial Revolution. It's really the first large-scale industrial city built solely for the purpose of producing cloth and producing profit for the mill owners. Here they were able to bring together capital, uh, nature in the form of the river to create a power system and also bring in a, a new kind of labor system to create this first large-scale city. Lowell became a model for other industrial cities and throughout the 19th century places like Lawrence and Manchester up and down the Merrimack River Valley and then ultimately all across New England and up and down the eastern seaboard would model themselves after Lowell. So this is really where industrial America begins. The whole reason that Lowell is here is the water power system. The Merrimack River in the space of about a mile and a half drops 32 feet. And that drop is what powers these mills. And the mills would be sited right alongside. So the water would flow in, flow underneath the basements of those mills, drop down through big tunnels called penstocks, flow through the penstock, drop down about 15 feet onto a water wheel, spin the water wheels, spin pulleys, leather belts, and ultimately run whole rooms, whole floors, and whole mills filled with machinery. Originally, as they're building Lowell, there aren't any workers around. This is really farm country. In, in Lowell in 1820, about 200 people lived in what today is a city of 106,000 people. Not a lot of a labor force to draw on. And so the mill owners uh, were forced to send recruiters out into the countryside, and they recruited the children of farmers out there. At the time, farms weren't doing very well, and many of the large farm families were looking for things for their, their children to do, and particularly their daughters. Uh, if you were a woman on the frontier in New England, very few opportunities opened to you. Maybe you could work as a, a domestic servant, maybe as a schoolmistress, but that's about yet. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for women to come in and work for the first time. And they would come by the thousands, even the tens of thousands in the 1830s and the 1840s. And first, because this was farm country, not very many places for them to live, so the companies built boarding houses specifically to house these mill girls that would come down to work in the mills. People imagine kind of tenement style dwellings and pretty cramped. Well, you'll see uh, it's a bit nicer than that. Certainly was a little bit cramped. You know, 30 or 40 girls would be living in a fairly small boarding house unit. But you'll see there there's parlor space that served as a kind of living room, but also a dining room space, the place where the girls would play musical instruments. There's a piano there. Upstairs in the boarding house, you'll see a, a bedroom, and in each one there will be two beds, two girls to a bed, so pretty close living uh, up there. Further up in the attic, any sort of leftover girls that didn't fit in a bedroom would be living uh, more or less dormitory style. Uh, you're living with 30 or 40 other girls in pretty close proximity. But there are benefits to that too. If you lived on the farm, maybe you wouldn't see anybody else your own age for you know, weeks at a time or months at a time. Here you have the camaraderie of a, a sort of like going to college and, and living in the dorms. Uh, you form some relationships that are really important to you throughout your life. But there were problems with it. It comes with a, a, a very, some very difficult and challenging working conditions. Uh, this is pretty tough labor for 11, 12 hours a day, six days a week in a hot, sweaty, humid environment filled with cotton lint. And some of the mill girls began to think about, well, might we uh, ask for more, more uh, wages, better working conditions. And they get together to form some of the first labor unions in the country. The Female Labor Reform Association was formed here uh, in Lowell in the 1830s, and they begin to stage walkouts, stage strikes. But by about the 1850s, the mill girls are deciding that this isn't the experience that they wanted, and they begin to head back home. The mill owners need to fill in and they turn to the Irish laborers that had been here all along, working, digging the canals, building the mill systems, and begin to bring in the Irish into the mills. And that's really the first wave of immigrants you see working here. And then throughout the 19th century, there will be waves of immigrants that come uh, to Lowell from really around the world and end up working in the mills. 
and you see a shift in the labor force from being really 80%, 90% women in the 1820s, 1830s, as more of the inner groups begin to flow in, there's much more of a mix. And you see men doing jobs that maybe women had done before. Men had always been part of the factory process, doing some of the work like uh, working with the carting machines. And they'd always worked as overseers and as mechanics. But now increasingly throughout the 19th century, they become machine operators as well. And by the end of the 19th century, you see about an even mix of men and women working on the floor of each one of these factories. By the end of the 19th century, Lowell is really changing and using far more steam power than hydropower. About 1881 or so, it's about half and half, and then it tips the balance the other way in the last couple of decades of the 19th century. Now, that, that steam power is interesting because it really puts Lowell out of business. You don't need to place it along a waterway. You don't need the drop in the water. And that's what Lowell's unique competitive advantage was. Well, once you can put a steam engine in there and do it efficiently and do it fairly cheaply, well, now you can put a factory anywhere you want. So by the 1880s, places like Fall River are far larger textile cities than Lowell ever was. What Lowell's model had created had now just put it out of business. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public.